On episode 224 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Gary Taubes and discuss his book, The Case Against Sugar. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 224. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness, the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Now, I wanted to take a moment out and spend a little bit of time with you and ask you how you're currently doing on your health and fitness journey. I know it's not always easy and sometimes we slip up and sometimes things just aren't going our way. If there's anything I can do to help, any challenges you're having, please do reach out to me. Uh, you can email me at main at forever.fitness and I'll be glad to respond back. Maybe it's a podcast episode I can do for you. Uh, maybe it's just a little bit of uh, just a little bit of tender love and care, just listening to what's going on, maybe give you a little bit of advice, or maybe you're ready for one of our coaching programs, or I can develop something that's better suited to your needs. So please do reach out to me and let me know what's going on with you, because I really do this to help you. And I want to help you and make you let you reach your health and fitness goals. So please let me help you by reaching out to me. We're in for a treat today. Uh, this conversation with Gary Taubes is awesome. Gary is the author of Why We Get Fat, Good Calories, Bad Calories. And today we're going to discuss his book, The Case Against Sugar. You've listened long enough. You know, I am not a big fan of sugar. Gary lays out a very good case for why you might want to avoid sugar. We talk a lot about that on this episode. I'm really excited to have him here. His book is already a bestseller. It's well worth it. All three of his books are well worth the time and effort. So with no further ado, I welcome Gary Taubes. So Gary, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Well, thanks for having me. The Case Against Sugar, excellent title, an excellent book. I really enjoyed reading this one. You have two other ones out that are also outstanding that I can't recommend enough. But this one, this one was really uh, eye-opening and I, and I really just, I enjoyed the history of it all, you know, because it was, it was more than just a, you know, this is, this is why sugar is bad for you. You really kind of talked about the history of the marketing and development of sugar and how through all these different stages, our impressions about sugar and the availability of sugar have just changed and not necessarily for the good. Yeah. And this is, I mean, I, in my writing, I feel, well, in the way I approach these nutritional issues, I believe it's absolutely critical to understand the history of the beliefs to begin with. But in this case, when I'm making an argument in 2017 that sugar is the primary trigger, environmental trigger of obesity and diabetes and the sort of single worst aspect of any Western diet, you have to explain why this is that hasn't been said for the past hundred years, why this is new or relatively new, or why it even has to be said at all if it's correct. And so that implies going back in time and looking at how people have discussed sugar in the past, and as you said, what the, not the research influences and the industry influences and the public health influences and sort of explaining how we got here and uh, why this book had to be written. Yeah, I, I mean, I was having a conversation with someone today and I said, you know, I like to give people the, the benefit of the doubt, but I think a lot of people really let the public down with the way that they approach certain things with, uh, you know, just trying to, for lack of a better word, cover up what they already knew about sugar, but didn't want everyone to kind of act on. Yeah. Again, I'm not actually sure. Also, <laughs> it's funny, maybe I don't give people enough benefit of the doubt. If you look at our nutrition policies from the mid 1970s onward, it was so completely dominated by this effort to get us to eat low fat diets, this belief system that the primary problem in the modern you know, Western diet is the fat content and that the definition of a healthy diet begins with it being low in fat. You know, and, and everyone who's ever eaten a skinless chicken breast has somehow bought into this concept. And that's what our government wanted us to the, that's the message they wanted to get across. The research community wanted to get it across. Most people still can't shake that belief system. And in the process of communicating that message, the message that was left out 
you know, sugar was the implication was that sugar was benign. And yet there was a competing hypothesis in the 60s and 70s that sugar was not just the cause of obesity, but the primary cause of what we now call, call metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance. And as such, the primary cause of type 2 diabetes. And in this steamrolling of the by the nutrition cardiology community to to implicate fat or to indict fat as the problem, they they exonerated sugar in the process. So it, it wasn't so much that they covered up what they knew, but that they rushed to judgment on fat, and in the process exonerated sugar. You know, and I think people people want a simple solution, and unfortunately, I, our bodies are are far too complex. I think to afford us a lot of simple answers. So, you know, like in your other book, calories are not just calories and, uh, you know, how, how you get your food and where you get it from is going to make a difference. Now, I want to go through some of the diseases that are attributable to sugar in some form or fashion and kind of talk about how, how that comes about. I guess in the book you said sometimes they thought that obesity was actually the cause of, say, diabetes and some other health issues. But they're actually just sort of symptoms of the same thing as you go along. So do you mind kind of going over obesity and how sugar might be making us fat where fat might not have? Yeah. So the the conventional thinking on sugar and the worst that the public health authorities would ever say about it for the past century, literally the past century, is that it's empty calories. And so the idea is we get fat because we consume more calories than we expend, which is it's sort of simplistic hypothesis that emerges from the state of the science in the early years of the very early years of the 20th century. And it's usually portrayed as somehow being a unquestionable uh, uh, implication of the laws of thermodynamics, which is just a kind of bizarre and naive uh, belief in and of itself. But the, so the idea is we get fat because we consume too many calories. Sugar is empty calories. It doesn't have vitamins and minerals in it. So if you consume a lot of calories from sugar, you're going to have to consume a lot of calories from other foods to get your necessary vitamins and minerals and protein and fiber. And now you're going to consume too many calories. And that's why you're going to get fat. And like I said, this is based on this very simplistic early 20th century thinking. And after that idea was locked in, that obesity was just caused by the excess consumption of calories, you basically have 100 years of medicine that emerges and, and biological understanding of the human, be- uh, the human body, which say that you know, when we consume foods, they do a lot of things other than bring calories or vitamins and minerals or fiber to the diet. They also have profoundly different effects. Different foods have different effects on the hormonal responses. And those hormones that are responding to the foods we eat are also have profoundly different effects on whether or not we're going to store calories as fat or burn them for fuel or store carbohydrates as glycogen or, you know, this process, this concept known as fuel partitioning. So in this case, it just so happens that when we're talking about sugar, so beet or cane sugar, or since the 1970s, high fructose corn syrup, we're talking about uh, carbohydrates that are roughly uh, 50% glucose, which is a carbohydrate that predominates in starches and grains, and 50% fructose, which is the sweetest of all the carbohydrates, and it's the one that makes sugar sweet. And you can find fructose and sucrose, this glucose-fructose combination, also in fruits, which is why fruits are sweet, and then to a lesser extent in vegetables and starches. But the dose is much smaller. And the idea is when we eat the glucose, when we eat sugars, and particularly sugary beverages with nothing with it, the glucose stimulates uh, insulin secretion that gets into the bloodstream, blood sugar starts going up, you secrete insulin in response. And the fructose is metabolized almost exclusively in the liver. And there is a lot of laboratory evidence suggesting that fructose or sugars, the fructose-glucose combination, create this condition known as insulin resistance, which is the fundamental defect in type 2 diabetes, and is so closely associated with obesity that you could assume that on some level, or you could speculate that it plays a causal role, at least insulin dysregulation plays a causal role in this accumulation of, of excess calories calories in our fat tissue. So the argument I'm making in this book is just 
instead of relying on this, you know, 120 year old sort of simplistic physics notion about why systems might get more massive, I'm saying if you actually look at the underlying endocrinology, and this argument was made in the 60s, then you would actually expect carbohydrates to be fattening, and the data suggests you would expect sugar, in part because of this fructose content, to cause insulin resistance and so diabetes. So you take it away from this simplistic physics idea and instead, and not that the physics is wrong, they're, they're called laws because they're always true, but they just don't tell you anything about why people actually accumulate fat or don't. And that's an endocrinological hormonal issue and there you implicate you know, sugar, again, because of the unique metabolism of the glucose and fructose combination. Now, I've had some other, even some doctors on the show, and it's really hard sometimes to get them to acknowledge, you know, they're still on the, you know, fat is bad, saturated fat is, is terrible, sugar is okay, but you just don't need that much of it. They're still on that dogma. And I had one doctor on and he said, well, it's going to be the fat that's going to clog the arteries and it's the sugar is just going to sort of make the arteries easier to clog. But that more and more we're learning that's not necessarily the truth. And there is a connection, direct, direct connection between the, our sugar intake and heart disease. Yeah. I mean, again, that, that saturated fat clogging the arteries and it always makes me sort of shrivel up inside whenever I even – you know, the informed media reporting today, and you'll see this phrase, artery clogging saturated fats, as though, you know, there's some conception that a greasy food, therefore that grease gets into your circulation, and it's the grease that gets into the atherosclerotic plaques. Again, it's this kind of incredibly naive way of thinking about these biological things. So, but it is indeed, you know, we focused, beginning in the 1950s, some very influential nutritionists began thinking that's actually dietary fat. First it was dietary fat raises cholesterol, which clogs your arteries. Then it was saturated fat raises LDL cholesterol, which because LDL cholesterol Cholesterol is associates with heart disease. It must be the saturated fat in the diet that gives us heart attacks. And then we, we completely focus on that. So all the public health efforts, as I said, were aimed at getting us to eat low-fat, low-saturated fat diets. But simultaneously, with that thinking about fat and cholesterol and heart disease, which could never be confirmed in experimental trials, so it was an interesting hypothesis. And study after study tested it, and it just never managed to be confirmed, including the biggest study ever done in the field, the Women's Health Initiative, which was a half a billion dollar diet trial in women, and it simply failed to demonstrate that women who ate less fat would have fewer heart attacks. As that dogma was setting in like ice on a pond, researchers were learning that heart disease is associated with a whole cluster of metabolic abnormalities. It's not just one thing, like LDL cholesterol is elevated, therefore you get heart disease. And in fact, most people get heart disease, or many of the people get heart disease, don't have elevated LDL cholesterol, but what they have is this cluster of abnormalities that includes low HDL cholesterol, which from the 1950s, even before the term HDL had been coined, researchers had pointed out that low HDL was a much, much better predictor of heart disease than high LDL. So low HDL, high triglycerides, high triglycerides elevated blood pressure, obesity, or excess fat accumulation, your waist is getting bigger, which is the by far the greatest risk factor for heart disease, and glucose intolerance, so kind of pre-diabetic condition. And wasn't until the late 1980s that these are all wrapped up in a, originally in this term syndrome X coined by the Stanford University physiologist Gerald Reven, and today we know it is metabolic syndrome. And the CDC says 75 million American adults have metabolic syndrome, and it's a pre-heart disease condition and a pre-diabetic condition, and it associates with obesity. Getting fatter is one of the diagnostic criteria of metabolic syndrome. And so for most of your physicians, virtually all of their patients who have heart disease will have it because of this metabolic syndrome, which is fundamentally a defect of insulin resistance. And again, the only reason insulin resistance isn't one of the diagnostic criteria is because the medical authorities think, and it's true, it's too hard for a physician to measure insulin resistance in their practice. I can't just do a 
blood sample and send it off to a lab like they can for HDL and triglycerides. So they leave insulin resistance out of metabolic syndrome, but it is a condition of insulin resistance. And all of these components of metabolic syndrome get worse when carbohydrate content goes up and particularly, you know, high glycemic index carbs, refined grains and easily digestible starches. And you could demonstrate all of them in that all that, that sugar will trigger all of them, either in animal models and even in, in human subjects. So it's sort of this idea that it's cholesterol saturated fat raising cholesterol clogging the arteries again is this kind of primitive almost plumbing like thinking about heart disease and the more nuanced and formed biological viewpoint that it's this dysregulation of insulin homeostasis for lack of a better word is well accepted but people still can't get rid of this old idea that it's the carb, that it's the fat and the cholesterol. And then the success of statins, however you define that, feeds into this because we think statins definitely uh, prevent heart disease and at least, you know, secondary prevention. And statins lower cholesterol, ergo we should all be eating low-fat diets, which again is a kind of leap of faith that boggles my mind, but it is indeed what we did in this country and around the world. Yeah, I, I think that's that's one of my overall frustrations is I'll, I'll see a commercial and they'll be like, you know, do you have high A1C? Take this pill and uh, it's it's going to lower your A1C. And I'm thinking, or just eat less sugar. I mean, I you know, years ago, well, actually, even the history of diabetes itself is fascinating because until the discovery of insulin, diabetes was perceived of as a carbohydrate intolerance disorder. Okay, so clearly... You know, people with diabetes couldn't consume, couldn't tolerate the carbohydrates in their diet because, at the, you know, if they were young and they had the acute form of diabetes, they, they didn't secrete insulin to respond to the carbohydrates. And if they were older and obese, this is even before we split diabetes into type 1 and type 2, physicians knew that there was an acute form that had, that struck young people and this sort of chronic form that struck older overweight people and it was assumed that it was all a deficiency of diabetes which turned out to be incorrect a uh, deficiency of insulin but in, until insulin was discovered the idea was look these people can't tolerate carbohydrates so don't feed them carbs so the standard diet for the the chronic form was a, basically a mostly animal product mostly meat diet with green vegetables as soon as insulin's discovered People start using insulin to treat diabetes, and it's a lifesaver for you know the acute form, what we now call type one. And now you need to use carbohydrates to balance ill-dosed insulin. So, and the thinking on the disease goes from it's a carbohydrate intolerant disorder to it's an insulin deficiency disorder because now we can give insulin and and ameliorate the disorder, and now we have to give carbs to balance. The insulin. So somebody's, you know, going into hypoglycemia. You give them some sugar or juice, and they recover. Therefore, carbs are good. And you know, as long as the community was focused and thinking of this disease as an insulin deficiency disorder, then you don't worry about how to treat it with diet. You don't worry about whether it can be treated with diet, even though there were papers published in JAMA back in the early 1920s saying low carb, high fat diets could effectively reverse this condition, you give them drugs and you focus, the pharmaceutical industry focuses on creating new and better drugs that can treat it. And now finally, uh, almost a hundred years after the discovery of insulin, people are saying, you know, it's no fun being diabetic. It's no fun taking all these drugs. And they still have all these terrible side effects of the diabetic condition. And maybe we could actually just change our diets and reverse it like this is some shocking concept yeah i was reading i was reading an article one time and they were asking a doctor why he didn't recommend they just change their diet and his answer was uh, they won't comply 
So we, we need better drugs. Yeah, and that's the belief system. So for 50 years, the advice in this country about how to lose weight is not just eat a low-fat diet, but eat a low-fat, low-calorie diet. So the idea is obesity is caused by taking too many calories. So what you have to do to reverse obesity is to get fat people to eat less. And you have to get them to exercise more, aside from the fact that every everybody in the world knows that the more they exercise, the hungrier they get. Sort of natural disassociation between the reality of their own lives and the advice that you would give to obese people. So you basically give them diets. You assume the cause of the disorder is incorrect. Then you give them diets based on your understanding of the cause that don't work and that make them both dissatisfied with what they're eating and hungry all the time while simultaneously only having a very limited effect on how much fat they have accumulated. And then when they don't stay on the diets or when the diets don't work, you blame them for not wanting to be on diets to begin with. So just this assumption by the medical community that diets don't work because nobody will comply is could be true. But what I would argue is that diets don't work because they are the wrong diets. And if you give them diets that do work, that actually make them thinner without starving them, then they'll be happy to comply because most people who go on diets do so because they want to be thin without or thinner without starving themselves. Okay. Now, I've heard a lot lately about, particularly about uh, people who will try to go into ketosis to avoid feeding their cancer. It's, it's getting more and more common, I think, for folks to, to experiment with ketosis when they, when they have cancer. But in the book, you, rec- you, you actually say that in many cases, cancer might actually be caused by sugar. Yeah, and I think that's, weirdly enough, an easier argument to make than uh, I have enormous respect for cancer and its ability to evolve around any attempt to treat it, sort of evolution at its maximal <laughs> level. But... So the argument, again, that I'm making in this book is that sugar is the prime suspect for being the prime dietary suspect for being the cause of obesity. Um, An easier way, a simpler way to think about it is that we have these obesity and diabetes epidemics that manifest themselves invariably whenever populations transition from whatever their traditional diet is to uh, Western diets and lifestyles. And you're asking the question, what is it in the Western diets and lifestyles that cause these epidemics? And the conventional thinking is, well, people just eat too much and there's too much food available and they're sedentary. But this alternative kind of biological perspective is it's some aspect of the carb content of the diet and, and looks like sugar again is is triggering insulin resistance and that's is diet type 2 diabetes and it's causing obesity in the process obesity and type 2 diabetes are both associated with increased risks of every chronic disease every common chronic disease and particularly well heart disease which we've been discussing and stroke cerebrovascular disease and then also cancer and neurodegenerative diseases like alzheimer's and as it turns out another line of research that's been taken a a long time. It started in the diabetes community with diabetes researchers realizing that insulin and insulin-like growth hormone stimulate tumor progression uh, and stimulate metastases and are basically uh, growth promoters for tumor cells. And it took them, because this was insulin and insulin-like growth factor were seen as a purview of diabetes researchers, they didn't, they weren't talking to the cancer researchers. Then finally around the late 1990s, early 2000s, this idea finally spreads to cancer research, but it's very localized. And now, finally, 2017, it's, you know, there's a lot of very influential researchers who are studying the influence of insulin and insulin-like growth factor on tumor progression. And the idea is that whatever elevates insulin in your bloodstream, whatever elevates circulating levels of insulin is going to work as a tumor promoter. And the more blood sugar... so. Tumors transition, most of them, in the course of their evolution into something called the Warburg effect, where they're basically sucking up enormous amounts of, of glucose from the bloodstream to fuel their proliferation. And in order to do so, they upregulate insulin and insulin-like growth factor receptors on their cell surfaces so they can pull in as much blood sugar as possible. And so the idea is whatever it is that elevates blood sugar and elevates insulin levels and elevates insulin-like growth factor 
and elevates the bioavailability of insulin-like growth factor is going to fuel tumor progression and metastases. And so, in effect, whatever it is that causes insulin resistance is going to, at the very least, exacerbate ca the cancers, if not you know, promote them or, or drive them to begin with. And then again, we're back to this question, what is it that causes insulin resistance? So if you read, there's a report that comes out every few years from the World Institute of Cancer Research and the American Cancer Research Institute. It's a joint report on diet and physical activity on cancers. And they'll say that the single most important thing people can do to inhibit, prevent the, or lower their risk of cancer is to be physically active because they think that insulin resistance is caused by getting fatter. And we get fatter because we consume more calories than we expend. And so people should increase the amount of calories they expend and that will inhibit this process. Again, you, based on this very simplistic physics idea. If you look at the biology, then you're saying, you know, what we want to do is to prevent to minimize our risk of cancer is prevent insulin resistance. And the way you prevent insulin resistance is by removing the sugars, grains, and starchy vegetables from your diet. And now, in effect, you're eating, you know, very low-carb, high-fat diets or ketogenic diets. So the idea is, you know, sugars and white flour cause this problem. You remove the sugars and the white flours, you will prevent not just insulin resistance, but, you know, minimize your risk of cancer by doing so. Now, in the book, you mentioned this, and I've actually heard or read this many, many times, that Alzheimer's is more and more being uh, linked to sugar. And as a result, many people are calling it the diabetes type 3. Could you take a few minutes and get into that? Well, and this is, so Alzheimer's is another, Alzheimer's dementia is another disease that associates with insulin resistance. So we know that risk increases with insulin resistance, risk increases with obesity and diabetes. It's a little confusing because diabetes also um, associates us strongly with cerebrovascular disease and you could de get dementia for, you know, stroke-related dementia that might be diagnosed as Alzheimer's-related dementia. But whatever it is, if you increase the likelihood, the, the risk of stroke-related dementia, you are going to increase at least the diagnosis of Alzheimer's-related dementia. And it turns out that there are mechanisms in the brain that depend on you know, insulin and insulin signaling. And when you dysregulate insulin and insulin signaling, you can demonstrate, for instance, at least in, in animal models, that you could dysregulate the enzymes that work to clear, for instance, uh, amyloid beta plaque from the brain. So you've got this association on a population-wide level that says the more insulin resistant you are, the more obese and diabetic, the greater your risk of Alzheimer's dementia. And then the researchers who study Alzheimer's, again, are slowly beginning to pay attention to the influence of high blood sugar and insulin dysregulation in you know, the cognitive mechanisms that are, you know, in effect, uh, broken in Alzheimer's disease. So, and there are people who, you know, there are anecdotal cases of people who find that they can minimize, you know, the manifestation of dementia in loved ones, for instance, by feeding them uh, ketogenic diets or feeding them uh, medium chain triglyceride oils, MCT oils, which promote ketone generation. So ketone use in the brain instead of glucose. So again, you've got a lot of lines of evidence, none of it definitive. And I talk about it in the sugar book, you know, the primary argument being again, that whatever causes insulin resistance is going to at least increase the likelihood of contracting a dementia that will be diagnosed as Alzheimer's dementia. And if you minimize the insulin resistance, if you remove that causal factor, which I'm saying is a sugar, you're going to reduce the risk of manifesting dementia of any kind. So I'm, I'm pretty sure we've, we've sold folks on at least considering uh, the amount of sugar that they're eating. At least I, I hope we have. If someone wanted to kind of come up with some guideline, what's your kind of impression on how much sugar is too much? And and if you don't mind sharing, roughly how much sugar do you eat per day? Well, very little. <laughs> Needless to say, um, okay, so there are two issues here that have to be taken into account. So, you know, when I'm arguing in this book, so the book is called The Case Against Sugar, which makes it sound like a legal argument. And I say in the author's note that if this were a legal 
issue, what I'm writing is the prosecutor's case. And then I acknowledge that the evidence is by no means definitive. So I can, I'm sure I could get an indictment in a legal case. I'm not sure I could get a conviction because we don't have a smoking gun. The studies are too hard to do. We're looking at research that takes years to decades to do correctly because we're looking at disease states that take decades to manifest themselves. So if you really wanted to, and these studies are going to be very expensive to do right. So in order to test the idea that like said, dietary fat causes heart disease or breast cancer in women, which was done in this Women's Health Initiative. They got 49,000 subjects. They ran them, you know, 20,000 were uh, randomized to a low-fat diet. They were run out for seven years, and the cost was roughly a half a billion dollars. And no studies like that have ever been done with sugar. You would need those kind of studies to really nail this question down, and I don't think they'd ever be done because I don't think there's a single person in the country, including the sugar industry, who doesn't think that the people on the randomized to the low sugar diet wouldn't be healthier, right? So they're gonna, you can save yourself a half billion dollars by just assuming that eating less sugar is gonna make you healthier. But anyway, so the issue here is, without that definitive data, what I'm still arguing is that sugar causes diabetes in much the same way that cigarettes, much the same definition of causality that we use when we say cigarettes cause lung cancer. So before cigarettes came around, lung cancer was a vanishingly rare disease. Non-smokers, it's still a vanishingly rare disease. Add cigarettes and the risk goes up by a factor of 10 to 20. And it becomes a relatively common disease in smokers. The interesting thing is we clearly, you can smoke too many cigarettes and end up with lung cancer. So as you're going through life, there's going to be one cigarette too many, at which point you're now on the way to lung cancer and there's no stopping it. And yet we don't tell people that too many cigarettes cause lung cancer or smoking too much causes lung cancer. What we say is cigarette smoking causes lung cancer. And if you're a physician, you tell your patients, your sm patients who smoke to quit. You don't even really care how unhappy they will be during the process of quitting because you have confidence that if they do quit, they'll get over it. They'll get to the point where they can't imagine why they smoke to begin with. They'll break the addiction in effect. So if that's the case with sugar and sugar causes diabetes and we stop saying too much sugar causes diabetes or overconsumption of sugar isn't good for you, overconsumption of anything by definition isn't good for you, you wouldn't call it overconsumption. If we just say sugar causes diabetes, then you've got a different, you know, then the question is, do physicians, do, do we have an obligation to consume as little sugar as we can? And that's something that we have to decide for ourselves because everyone is going to weigh this risk differently and they might weigh it differently depending on their, you know, whether or not they gain weight easily, whether or not they have a history of obesity and diabetes in their family, whether they're suddenly in their 30s or 40s and they find that they're getting heavy or they go to their doctor and their doctor says, you know, your HDL is low, your triglycerides are high, you've got metabolic syndrome. My feeling is we have to always balance the desire to enjoy our lives and to live well with the balance, the desire to live as long and as healthy a life as possible. And we all make that balance. We all do that equation differently. But the other issue is then this question of whether or not sugar's a sort of a lack of a better word, a drug. So the first chapter of my book is called Drug or Food, and I discuss this issue of whether or not sugar is addictive, whether we should think of it as a drug. It clearly has psychoactive effects. And anyone who has a kid, just a parent, you don't need a scientist to say that there's something unique about sugar sugar and makes your children crave to ration your children's sugar consumption. Really, in, in 2017, the only things parents have to really ration, I mean, maybe some of those parents are lucky enough that they have to get their kids off of books and off of studying and going outside to play a little, but most of us have to ration sugar and we have to ration screen time. And that's pretty much it. And for many of us, it's easier to eat no sugar at all or to try and avoid it entirely than it is to try and consume in moderation. So, you know, again, when you're trying to decide 
if you can give up the obvious sources of sugar, which I obviously think we should, which are the sodas and the fruit juices and the you know the sweet snacks and the sugary cereals and the sugary yogurts and and the desserts, and turn it into a luxury like it used to be. You know, 200 years ago, when diabetes was a vanishingly rare disease, we got about as much sugar in one week as you would get in a single 12-ounce can of Coca-Cola. So you turn it from something you consume day in and day out from the moment you wake up to the last thing you eat at night into a luxury of the kind it used to be, you're going to be healthy. I think you're certainly going to be healthier. And I can't imagine why, you know, that you're going to be less healthy. But all these things have to be taken into account. I mean, I had someone ask me the other day, are you telling me gummy bears are deadly? It's like, well, not in the short term. (laughs) Not in low doses, but at some point what we effectively do all day long is consume liquid or solid versions of gummy bears. And that's unnatural to the human condition. It's a brand new addition to human diets, like 200 years old, and the 200 years happen to coincide with these explosive epidemics of obesity and diabetes and maybe even cancer and Alzheimer's. Yeah, I kind of look at it and say, you know, if I think about it, fruits, whether they ripen on a tree or they're berries or or whatnot, those fruits are only going to be ripe for a very short period of time. And then you're going to, you're going to have them and you may gorge on them because, you know, you don't get this opportunity very often, but then, then they're gone. And then you're, you're eating the leafy greens and the meats and fish and all the other things. But unless you, your body, unless your, your ancestors were, were from the kind of the, the more tropical areas, you didn't really get a lot of high sugar fruits uh, back then. And it was only with the advent of, uh, you know, the transportation to move these things around uh, quickly so that we could get them. We wouldn't typically have fresh bananas sitting in our, in our market every day. You know, that would be something we would see very, very rarely and typically only, again, if you were in a very tropical place. Yeah, well, that's the thing. And so even the fruits, and we recommend everyone should eat fruit all day long, all year long, because of the vitamin content. But as you said, it would have been a, a best seasonal. And even then, I've been wondering lately, if there are populations that in which diabetes really explodes and explodes quickly, like in the Native American populations, um, Inuit populations, South Pacific Islanders. And for the most part, these would have been populations. I mean, again, they would have seen no sugar at all until the coming of, you know, the Westerners. And I think Jared Diamond should have called his book guns, germs, and steel, maybe might have been called guns, germs, steel, and sugar, and alcohol. We could throw that in as well. And tobacco. But anyway, that's the thing. Yeah, these things would have been very rare. They would have been seasonal, even populations. There were hunter-gatherer populations that consumed significant honey, but you didn't get the honey all year long either. So you had plenty of time to, in effect, recover from the whatever binge consumption you might have done of these fructose-rich foods. And you have examples through history where people do describe, like even you know, 2,000 years ago, discussions in the ancient Rome of the slaves getting fat during fig season. And discussions uh, 200 years ago in the Caribbean of the slaves getting fat during when they were cutting the sugar cane. So despite having a, a daily, I can't call it an occupation, being forced to do one of the most arduous jobs that humans have ever created, which is sugarcane cutting. I once saw an estimate that the sugarcane cutters burn 9,000 calories a day. You still have these observations from uh, physicians and, and, and individuals at the time saying that the slaves would put on excess fat during these periods of the year. So it's sort of, you know, on one level it's obvious, and on the other level getting people to buy into it, there's still this aspect that if you argue that sugar is anything other than a, a treat and an expression of love from parent to child or grandparent to child, pause that refreshes that you're a quack and a food zealot. And that's a shame. So again, uh, the, the book is The Case Against Sugar, and, and Gary, I really enjoyed it. Uh, there's a lot of great information. It's very well researched. I think you 
you proved your case well enough that I, I would probably go ahead and, and convict, but I might be a little biased. They might not put me on the jury. But uh, if someone wanted to get in touch with you or learn more about the book, where would you like for me to send them? Well, my, my website has a way to contact me at GaryTaubes.com. So G-A-R-Y-T-A-U-B-E-S.com. Now we will, uh, we will have that in the show notes. So you can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 224, and I'll have the links to Gary's website and the book there. Uh, So again, Gary, thank you so much for being on 40 Plus Fitness. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you know someone who would benefit from it, I'd really appreciate if you would share this with them so they can get the benefit of Gary's knowledge and experience and what he shared with us today. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness, we meet Rick Force. This guy emailed me a few weeks ago, and we got to talking, and his story is kind of fascinating. Uh, He had a huge weight loss success, and I really wanted to bring him forward and let him share what he's learned on his own journey. So next time, Rick Force. Until then, have a happy and healthy day. (music) 